Good day, it's April 22, 2023. The largest settlement so far in the U.S. history from a defamation lawsuit was reached this week between Dominion Voting System versus Fox News. The amount Fox News agreed to pay Dominion is a staggering sum of $787.5 million. I'm Esmeralda Padilla Gold, and welcome to The Pulse. And I'm Sam Buban. In a defamation lawsuit that was filed by Dominion Voting Systems against Fox News over persistent lies by their anchors in the primetime news saying for so many weeks that the 2020 presidential election was rigged by Dominion Voting System to make Joe Biden win. The claims that has been debunked by various law enforcement agencies who investigated the allegations and court decisions did not stop Fox from airing false claims until the lawsuit against them was filed. Personalities at Fox News, led by Sean Hannity, Tucker Carlson, and Maria Bartiromo, were leading the charge of falsehood and misinformation to augment the lies that Donald Trump himself has been peddling to its Republican base that the 2020 election has been stolen from him. Dominion Voting System and its defamation lawsuit claims that the reputation and potential revenue of the company leading to the future elections has been tarnished. And Dominion was seeking accountability from the network giant Fox Corporation, which is owned by billionaire Rupert Murdoch, a big Republican donor has mentioned in a deposition that the false narratives about the stolen election and Dominion was decided by the Fox News and the highest decision maker as having to do with numbers and rating. Numbers of audience and ratings translate to profit for the company. Most Republicans, including Trump loyalists, normally watches Fox News and are being peddled lies. And Fox News wanted to continue to cater to that viewership as competition with Newsmax and the One America Network were gaining on a significant chunk of Fox viewers moving to those two other networks. Pennsylvania and Georgia and North Carolina so much longer. Millions of Americans understandably are asking that question and questions like it. Those are real questions. Our current system does not inspire confidence. Unless they get a real answer, no amount of threats or censorship, and they're getting both, will make the population shut up. People have legitimate concerns about the integrity of our elections. And right now, a lot of those concerns center on the software that many states use to keep track of ballots. Several Trump campaign attorneys, prominently Sidney Powell, say they have evidence that certain voting software was rigged and that millions of ballots were changed from Donald Trump to Joe Biden. That is a shocking claim, but we do not dismiss it out of hand. We're dealing here on the left with people who support third trimester abortion and BLM riots. So clearly they have no limits by definition. What wouldn't they do? On the other hand, those are very serious charges. And you'd better have evidence if you make those charges. And of course, we were not going to endorse that story before we see the evidence ourselves. We asked say, to see that evidence. We haven't yet received it. If it exists, we will see it soon. There's a timeline on this. In Pennsylvania, the deadline to certify the election results is November 23rd. That's a week from today. So legitimate claims of fraud will be proven by then or they won't be. Right now, though, what's interesting is the total unwillingness of anyone in power even to entertain the idea that there might be something wrong with any of the election software that was used two weeks ago. What's weird about that is that worries about election software are not a conspiracy theory, and they're not even partisan. They are long-standing, and they have been widely aired. Four years ago, CNN told us that scientists were convinced there might have been hacking of the software in the 2016 election. The decision of Fox News to settle the case monetarily came minutes before the start of jury trial of the defamation case against Fox, which, if it is preceded with a trial, Fox chairman and CEO Rupert Murdoch, according to many legal analysts, could have Murdoch on the witness stand. This sudden turn of events in the Dominion case against Fox now sends a chilling effect to other defendants of other lawsuits filed by Dominion. 
a separate lawsuit that is still in progress is Dominion's case against Newsmax and One American Network, who are also considered by many as the other mouthpiece of the conservative conservatives and has Trump loyal viewership. Besides these two conservative TV networks, Dominion has also filed $1.3 billion lawsuit against individuals like Rudy Giuliani and Sidney Powell, who went on speaking tours peddling their conspiracy theories about the rigged election involving Dominion voting system. In the vote tallies, in the middle of the night after they've supposedly stopped counting. And that's when the Dominion operators went in and injected votes and changed the whole system. And it affects votes around the country, around the world, and all kinds of massive interests of globalist dictators, corporations, you name it. Everybody's against us except President Trump and we the people of the United <laughs> States of America. <laughs> What we are really dealing with here and uncovering more by the day is the massive influence of communist money through Venezuela, Cuba, and likely China in the interference with our elections here in the United States. The Dominion voting systems, the Smartmatic technology software, and the software that goes in other computerized voting systems here as well, not just Dominion, were created in Venezuela at the direction of Hugo Chavez to make sure he never lost an election after one constitutional referendum came out the way he did not want it to come out. But one of its most characteristic features is, is its ability to flip votes. It can set and run an algorithm that probably ran all over the country to take a certain percentage of votes from President Trump and flip them to President Biden, which we might never have uncovered had the votes for President Trump not been so overwhelming in so many of these states that it broke the algorithm that had been plugged into the system. And that's what caused them to have to shut down in the states they shut down in. That's when they came in the back door with all the mail-in mail -in ballots and I want the American public to know right now that we will not be intimidated. American patriots are fed up with the corruption from the local level to the highest level of our government. And we are going to take this country back. We are not going to be intimidated. We are not going to back down. We are going to clean this mess up now. President Trump won by a landslide. We are going to prove it and we are going to reclaim the United States of America for the people who vote for freedom. These cases have yet to go to trial in courts. These lawsuits were mostly filed in the District of Columbia federal courts. Other defendants in separate Dominion lawsuits are CEO Mike Lindell of the MyPillow, who is a Trump loyalist, and CEO of Overstock.com, an online shipping, uh, shopping network, Patrick Byrne, are both being sued by Dominion for $1.6 billion each. Fox News' Tucker Carlson has admitted publicly that he hates Trump for the lies. But the corporate Fox wanted to host to continue with the false narratives to keep the loyal audience from moving to other networks. These cases filed by Dominion are not alone. Another company who are in the same business as Dominion had filed in court similar defamation lawsuits, and that company is Smartmatic Voting Machines. Smartmatic Voting Machines lawsuits against these entities and individuals has yet to go to trial. Guns, uh, Christian nationalism, and war against women and war against the poor Americans now dominates the platform and center stage for the 2024 election in most Republican states. Last week alone, Governor Ron DeSantis of Florida, an extremist Republican according to many media outlets, has quietly signed a bill approved by the Republican-controlled Florida legislator to ban abortion after six weeks of pregnancy. The ban literally forbids all kinds of abortion in the Florida state. As many women who get pregnant does not even know yet that they are pregnant during a six-week period. 
after the reversal of the landmark case Roe v. Wade by the U.S. Supreme Court, who has a conservative majority, state after state has been relentless in their effort to deprive American women and their physicians of reproductive decisions. They are systematically working to end this right to choose between having a child or not having it. What is even more barbaric about these legislations are forcing a woman to carry a child resorting from rape or incest, as there are no provisions for exceptions to terminating the pregnancy in case of rape or incest. Also just last week, a Trump-appointed federal judge in Texas had issued a decision on April 7, 2023, to stop distribution and availability of the abortion pill Mifepristone, an FDA-approved drug, U.S. District Judge Matthew Kaczmarek, a Trump appointee conservative judge, suspended the FDA approval of the abortion pill that is currently being prescribed by gynecologists to thousands of women who wants to terminate unplanned pregnancy. The move by this conservative judge, judge is unprecedented in overriding an approval by FDA on any drugs. What Judge Kaczmarek did is an unusual suspension of a Food and Drug Administration's approval of a drug. This precedent alarmed physicians, women all over the country, and civil rights and constitutional rights group, including members of Congress. It also shocked the pharmaceutical industry. The Biden administration, through the Department of Justice, filed a lawsuit in the U.S. Supreme Court to put a hold on the te Texas judge's decision. In a battle for the availability of the abortion pill, Maffey Prestone, two federal judge in Washington state issued a dueling decision, directly contradicting the Texas judge decision. In the Washington federal judge's decision, they are ordering the FDA to keep the Maffey Prestone available. The U.S. Department of Justice, who represents the FDA and the Biden administration's position, was able to get a temporary stay in the enforcement of Judge Kaczmarek order in the Court of Appeals, and the case has now been elevated to the U.S. Supreme Court. Some legal analysts consider Judge Kaczmarek's action as another of those weird rulings by Trump-appointed judges and compares it to the now-disgraced judge who ordered a special master in the Mar-a-Lago top-secret document case, which was thrown out by the U.S. Supreme Court, citing the Federal Court of Appeals that the move by the said Florida judge was without merit and relevance to an ongoing FBI investigation. Many legal scholars are expecting the conflicting rulings by the Texas judge and two Washington state judges will end up in a showdown of the two ideological sides in the U.S. Supreme Court. Where did all this ideological divide begin? The conservative Christian movement, who has been grooming for more than 30 years since the Reagan presidency, a generation of people who later were able to work for the government in the legislature and in the judiciary, and has come to power through political influence during election by the white evangelical Christians, Christian nationalists, megachurches, TV evangelists, who had joined forces to support then-candidate Donald Trump, who would listen to them and made concessions to appoint conservative judges to the bench, about 200 of them to the federal courts, and these judges are sympathetic to the cause of this Christian extremist who believe in establishing a theocracy now, similar to the one in Iran, Saudi Arabia, and Afghanistan, who are imposing one religion on all its people. The rise of Christian nationalism and their goal towards a man-made theocracy continue to be a danger to our democracy. According to many Christian pastors I have spoken to and constitutional lawyers, it is not true that they claim that our founding fathers created a Christian nation, but instead they created a constitutional democracy that is Christian in value. 
the true Christian value of justice, equality, and freedom. Jesus Christ has criticized this kind of groups that we have now in the Bible, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, who ruled the people of Israel through religion and laws that created hardship for its people. The eroding of our constitutional rights as citizens of this democratic country were systematically being dismantled during the past six years, as there are fewer freedom-loving members in many Republican-controlled legislature, judges, and even in the United States Supreme Court. So, if you have been unaware of what's going on, it's time to wake up and keep notice. We have a choice of whether to keep this country a democracy or a fascist theocracy. Choose democracy. Get involved in defending our freedom during the general election next year, 2024. We are going to take a commercial break. Please stay with us. Welcome back to The Pulse. The years of working dangerously for journalists around the world has gotten worse. In 2022 alone, 363 journalists were detained worldwide, according to the Committee to Protect Journalists, or CPJ. In a report from Wall Street Journal, the number has doubled since they started tracking jail journalists in 2015. The recent arrest and detention of Wall Street Journal reporter Ivan Gerskovich in Russia last month is an example of increasing attacks on journalists. These attacks are not merely foreign journalists has become brazen in many countries, and most of those victimized are local journalists in those countries. Top three of the list of countries that has detained journalists are Iran with 62, China 43, Myanmar 42, and Turkey has 40 journalists imprisoned. Other countries with sizable detention of journalists by ranking include Belarus, Egypt, Vietnam, Russia, Eritrea, and Saudi Arabia. 62 other countries not named here are also journalists, has journalists in their prisons. In a separate report from the multiple media outlets, Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida expressed concern about the detention of Gershevich in Russia and said he will lead a push for protection of journalists worldwide in the G7 summit in Hiroshima, Japan. This, year's, this year, Japan will host the G7 summit and among the attendees, will be President Joe Biden. In Yemen early this week, at least 78 people died in a stampede in Yemen's capital, Sana'a. This was a big number of deaths in a single day in Yemen, unrelated to the conflict. According to a report by Reuters, a group of merchants were doing a traditional Ramadan gift-giving at a school where hundreds of people gathered, which amounted to 5,000 Yemeni rials or 9 U.S. dollars. According to a medic who was on the scene of the tragedy, when the gate of the school opened, there was a big rush of people, and some starts falling in the yard as they tried to reach the door of the school where the almsgiving will take place. Beside the 78 that have died on the stampede, there were also dozens who sustained injuries, according to the Houthi Health Ministry. For our viewers who still don't know, there is an 
long-running civil war in Yemen and extreme poverty and sufferings on its people. As world relief goods are not reaching the countryside due to blockage of transport and logistics by the forces in control of the capital, Saudi Arabia has also been responsible for indeliberate bombings of towns and villages in Yemen. We'll be right back after a break. Please stick around. We use headphones as a part of our everyday lives. Whether we're at work, getting exercise, meditating, in transit, studying, practicing, or relaxing. Hi, I'm Ryan Sway, the founder of Aircom. I would like to introduce the world's first wireless airflow audio earbuds. As a festival and a concert junkie, I really enjoy the live experience of being there and feeling the music. When we started developing Airflow, our goal was to reproduce that live experience using earbuds. The problem with traditional headphones is that the speakers are located inside of the earpiece, literally giving you centimeters before the audio hits your eardrum. What Aircom is doing, they're the first company to actually address the fact that there needs to be a space involved associated with having the sound waves expand fully. The difference between traditional headphones and Aircom audio is that the air tube gives you eight times more space, allowing the sound waves to fully develop before they actually hit your eardrums. And this gives it a much more live, natural sound, just like in a recording studio. It's real nice that someone actually addressed the physics associated with how sound comes out. The challenge we had was to create an earbud with enough airspace for the sound to fully develop and breathe. Unfortunately, traditional earbuds are about the size of a jelly bean, and there's just not enough airspace. However, that changed when we developed Airflow Audio. Airflow uses an air tube to deliver six to eight times more airspace than traditional earbuds. The end result is a true live listening experience, just like you're at a festival or a concert. We also added magnets to the back of the earpieces so you can wear it around your neck when you're not using it. Being that the drivers are eight inches from the earpiece, the magnets do not affect the integrity of the sound at all. The orange line represents the frequency transmitting through the wire to the speaker, which then converts to the blue sound wave that develops more as it travels up the air tube, producing a balanced, full body and live listening experience. Another really cool feature is that these earbuds are sweat proof and water resistant because they're coated with a super hydrophobic nanotechnology. So now you can be on a skateboard or riding a motorcycle and listen to music as if you were watching a live show or actually in a recording studio. We're coming to you for help in bringing these unparalleled earbuds to market. Welcome back to the polls. In the country of Sudan, a civil war had broken out this week as forces commanded by two former allies in the ruling council engaged in a power struggle and intensified gun firefight in the capital of Khartoum and other cities like El Fashir. According to a report on Reuters, at least 330 people had already died in the conflict in a matter of days. The country that has currently depended on food aid from world relief efforts had been tipped off into a humanitarian crisis, according to the United Nations. Thousands had fled the capital city of Khartoum. 
the latest violence was triggered over an internationally backed plan to form a new civilian government. Both sides accused the other of thwarting the plan. The plan, which was uh, designed by the group known as the Quad, uh, involving U.S., England, United Arab Emirates, and Saudi Arabia, has pushed for international efforts to find a political solution in Sudan. Sudan's military ruler, General Abdil Fattah al-Burhan, heads the military council that was formed in 2021 after the coup d'etat ouster of veteran autocrat Omar al-Bashir and paramilitary commander Muhammad Hamdan Dagalo was the deputy to General al-Burham in the council. Dagalo, who is widely known as Hemedti, may be in command of 100,000 troops according to some analysts. There was also reporting that about 320 Sudanese soldiers may have fled to neighboring country of Chad. A reporting coming from Chadian capital in Jemina stated that 320 Sudanese soldiers that had encroached into Chad and were likely retreating from fighting has been disarmed by the Chadian military. Meanwhile, the Biden administration announced it will be sending a large number of additional troops to the U.S. military base in the country of Djibouti near Somalia in case they will be needed for evacuation of U.S. citizens in Sudan. The best possible things that can happen, according to John Kirby, the White House spokesman, is for a ceasefire to take place. We are out of time for this episode. We hope you can join us again next week here at The Pulse. I'm Esmeralda Padilla-Gold, and thank you for watching. And I'm Sam Buban, also thanking you for watching. God bless your week.